Welcome to the EMEA Recruitment Podcast, produced in partnership with our friends at Operation Smile. We're raising vital funds for Operation Smile's volunteers to deliver life-changing surgery to children born with cleft lip and palate. You can find out more and donate to the cause at emearecruitment.com forward slash operation dash smile. In this episode, we're joined by Mark Steele, the Director of Corporate Planning at International Air Transport Association. We learn about his global career and why we should take opportunities when they arise. So hello, everybody. Welcome to the next episode of the EMEA Recruitment Podcast in partnership, as ever, with our good friends over at Operation Smile. So as my colleague Rose has mentioned, we're delighted to welcome Mark Steele onto the podcast today. So hopefully you can still hear me, Mark. Yes, I can, Paul. Pleasure to be with you. Thanks for asking. Uh, it's me great. It's great to speak with you as well. And we've got a good range of questions coming up today, some of which have come from our team internally some externally so hopefully it should be interesting for you and uh yeah hopefully not not too challenging for you though we'll keep try and keep it light <laughs> <laughs> sounds good <laughs> so i mean obviously mentioned earlier that the show is in partnership with operation yeah. smile and i'd like to kind of I have a question that eases the guests into the podcast a bit so i just thought i'd ask you mark you know what what was the last thing that made you smile well it was up until this morning, I was I was thinking, what can I what can I say? What can I say? And then one of my colleagues told me a real good dad joke. Okay. And it made me laugh. So I'll tell you what it was, and you, then you can decide whether it made you smile <laughs> or not. So so it goes like this. So what's the difference between people from Dubai and people from Abu Dhabi? I don't know. I don't you know, know. Right. So the difference is the people from Dubai don't like the Flintstones, but the people from Abu Dhabi do. Ah, oh, there you go. That's it. I was thinking, where's this going? That's it. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> You're right. That is, uh, that is a first-class dad joke, that one, isn't it? I'm <laughs> yeah. trying to sign them out ages, I think. Keep it for later. <laughs> Bring it out at Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> it's a proper bad joke. So that made me laugh. That was like nine o'clock this morning. That was, a good, that, was, that, was a, that was a good way to start the day. And I thought I'm going to use that. I, I need that for I need that for the podcast. <laughs> well, it's a good good way to start your week. It's not. Uh... I guess it's not the typical way you start your week in, the, in, in on the Monday morning telling the dad jokes, but it's good a good way to uh, to start this week at least. Anyway, it certainly was. It certainly was. <laughs> so I mean, I know obviously you know we're gonna we're gonna talk a bit about your 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 career, the changes you made, the things you've you've learned over over time, and um, I mean, I, I guess do we find you in in Switzerland today, Mark? Is that where you're you're still based? Yes. Yeah. So based in Geneva. Uh, right next to the airport, um, that's where our offices are. Uh, I've been with IATA for about eight years now. Um, mm-hmm. And previously to that, I was with Nissan, the automotive manufacturer, for 22 years in mm-hmm. different roles around Europe. And uh, But for the past 14 years, so including some years with Nissan, I've, I've been based here in Switzerland. Yeah, because you've had Switzerland. I know you've worked in Finland before, the Netherlands, Paris, obviously, and and uh, and the UK, so uh, well well travelled in some uh, nice places to be based. I mean, yeah. do you, what do you think you you kind of taken from that experience of working in all these different uh, different places? Yeah, I've I've been really I have been lucky. I've worked in some great cities and with some with some great people. Um, the thing I would take away from it is that everybody's even though we have these cultural cultural norms. Um, you, know, you, have, you think the French are a particular way or the German are, Germans are a particular way or the Dutch are a particular way. It's really when you get down to individuals um, that you, you, you find the real characters. Um, and the stereotypical things are somewhat helpful in, in guiding how you deal with people, but you know, not to be trusted completely. And you find good people everywhere. You find awkward people everywhere you find people you can get on with everywhere and 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 it's um I, i've really you know benefited from these these moves and travels around and realized that yeah almost in in almost any situation you can find common ground mm. um and it's it's really important that you do that and you do that quickly 
and uh, and build trust. And that's yeah. how you that's how you break down these uh, these barriers of language and uh, etiquette and uh, social norms um, between between cultures. Mm. So mm. I've been I've been I've been really fortunate in that respect um, mm. to get to that stage in life where you know it's that's really clear to me. Uh, mm. So it's helped me a lot. Mm. I mean, it's interesting what you kind of mentioned there on the on the trust element to it. You know, the the you know, building relationships and, mm. and the trust there is is a key part of success in the career and and mm. and the direction you can take your career. And I mean, obviously, you mentioned earlier you had twenty two years at uh, in Nissan and then eight years in in the current role. So you well, the current business. So you're somebody who has a track record of you know long term. Uh, buy into a business they, the the business obviously buys into you there's a high trust element there I mean and it's something you you see less and less in in the world today I mean I think you, you know if, if you it used to be the case if someone moved away from a business within five years it was seen as a bad thing and now it that, that's gone down to about two years I think so yeah. but you're yeah. you're kind of going against the, the trend on that side so it is I mean what, what is there a reason for that for yourself well, do you think yeah you, you I think I think well you know Nissan is a massive corporation and even though it was 22 years and, and it went by quickly, um, the longest I ever stayed in one role or the same role was three years. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> so um, I was able to, and I was given these opportunities um, to move on and do different things. So I started off in the finance department at the manufacturing plant up in Sunderland. Uh, and that is a baptism of fire. <laughs> you, you get to deal with um, some really hardy uh, <laughs> people from Sunderland <laughs> and, and Newcastle and uh, Middlesbrough. And um, when you're dealing with those guys, you, you know, you, you've got to be straight and serious. And um, so, that was, so that was the first four years. And then an opportunity came up to move to the European headquarters in Amsterdam. Um, I did that. And that was three years there and implementing SAP for, for Nissan around Europe. And then the alliance came along with Renault. Um, that happened uh, just at the end of um, the three years in Amsterdam. And they were looking for some cross fertilization between Renault and Nissan. So there was a bunch of people who were expatted into Renault and a bunch of Renault people who were expatted into Nissan. And I was one of the guys who ended up in Paris. Um, again, I mean, that was a completely different organisation to Nissan. Um, I tried to change Renault from the inside. <laughs> I, was, mm. I, I, I think I changed the people around me, but I didn't get as far as to the, <laughs> the whole organisation. Um, but that, 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 that was great fun. And then up, another opportunity came to, again to move back to Amsterdam. And then another opportunity two years later to move to Helsinki in Finland and create a... Uh, a new organization for Nissan, the Nordic organization. So I had Nordic responsibility, I had a CFO role. And so, it, yeah, it, 22 years sounds like a lot, but when you break it down, it was it was lots of, you know, smaller chunks. Mm. Um, and, and, and Nissan gave me those opportunities and I'll, I'll be forever grateful to them. Mm -hmm. uh, and, then, and then, you know, after, after Finland coming here to, to Geneva, for the last um, the last yeah six years or so of my career, so yeah, so it would have been it would have been six years in the same role, but the role kept getting bigger. So I started off just with um, gem being the, the the director for general and overhead control within Europe, and then they added real estate to the portfolio, and then they added the um, technology division to the portfolio. So it kept growing, and Nissan was one of those organisations where there was always something happening and. So I was I was able to take um, take these opportunities when they came along. I mean that that's I think something interesting because uh, you know many people who have let's say similar careers to yourself across different uh, countries uh, and uh, and and have taken opportunities when they come come around. They, they often describe these things as maybe given opportunities or they were lucky to be in the right place at the right time. I think they're two both two phrases you, you've used as well mm -hmm. in 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 describing this. But I suppose the reality is that. Um, 
you know, people do get offered these opportunities, but then a lot of people will, will turn them down and, and, and mm. maybe uh, decide mm. to stay with a less less risky career path, you know, because mm. I suppose as you're moving around, you know, all your roles in these different countries, in each case there, there would be an argument to say, well, I don't want to move again. I want to, to settle mm. down, you know, in one, yeah. in one place. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, I'm just trying to think of advice you might give to other people going through this uh, in their own careers at the moment where, you know, they're torn between making that risky move or yeah. a more risky move or staying where they are and, and having less risk and how you kind of evaluated that when you were going through it. I went through this only once really when um, I I'd, I'd moved, moved from the UK to Amsterdam, Amsterdam to Paris and then back to Amsterdam. And then the Helsinki thing came up. And at that point, we had a young child who was was born in Paris, and then we quickly moved back to Amsterdam after he was born. And my wife was saying, oh, do do we really want to move again? You know, we've just come back to Amsterdam, friends around us are nice and settled. (laughs) Um, Is it, should we really do it? And I I actually, so I I pondered it for a long time. I knew career-wise it was, Absolutely the right thing to do. But we had made all these moves and my wife had made some sacrifices as well. And I thought, okay, you know, you, you, should we should we should we not move? And I gave the feedback to my to my vice president who'd asked me at the time. And I, and I said, look, I'm not really sure about this. So I'm gonna say thank you, but but no. Well, I didn't sleep that night. <laughs> I, and I knew I'd made the wrong decision. Mm-hmm. So I like at eight o'clock the next morning, I, saw, I spoke to my wife. I was traveling, I was away. And um, I said, look, I, I really, I've not slept all night because I, I think I've made the wrong decision and I really want to go for this. So are you, are you with me on it? Yes, she's with me. I've had a super supportive wife. She's, you know, we've, we've done all these moves together. And um, so I phoned up the VP that very <laughs> minute. I said, look, I've had a rethink. Um, I think it's the best thing for me. Career-wise, it's the best thing for me. Um, so I'd like to change my mind and I'd like to accept the role. And he was mm-hmm. a really nice guy. I worked with him for a long time and he said, great, I'm really happy you've you've made that decision. He thought it was the right thing for me as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was the so I've I've been through a little bit of that. Um what I would say is um to anybody considering that, you go weigh up all the pros and cons. Um don't don't be afraid. Um, you know, wherever you go, you will find like-minded people. You will find the good in roles and the good in the places where you live. And I've I've always said this as well, you know, you've got to give these things six months. Wherever you go, whichever you roll in, the minimum you've got to give it is six months. After that, you can say, decide whether you don't like it or you've made you know wrong decision. But six months minimum and, and go for it. Life, life is short, and um, when opportunities come your way to go and live in another country and experience another role or another place, another culture, it, it definitely broadens your horizons and it makes you makes you a better person. No, it's really good to you kind know, of advice and the way of looking at it. And I think you know, you also mentioned your your wife there as well. And I think a big part of this is you know having the a supportive you know husband, wife, family behind the the moves that are, yes. are made. You know, and I think as you know, kids uh, come into the equation as well, it gets it's harder critical. each time. <laughs> it's critical. It's critical. Mm. You know, you yeah, you got to make these things to, these decisions together and. My wife has been very, very supportive the, the whole the whole time. Hi, everybody. It's Paul Thomas here. I hope that you're well and you're enjoying the podcast so far. Thank you once again for your continued support listening to the podcast. I just wanted to break into the recording to talk to you about a really exciting partnership that EMEA Recruitment has along with Operation Smile. And as founder of EMEA Recruitment, it's an honor and a privilege to announce this partnership. Personally, I was born with a cleft lip and palate, so the mission of Operation Smile is something that I have a strong personal connection with. It's not an understatement to say that the dentists and surgeons that helped me were life changers. It's not only about the actual operations that take place, the support and care post and pre-operation are beyond value. And from personal experience, I can only say that I'd not be the confident, happy person I am today without this support. 
I want to help children experience the support and care and skill that I experienced on my journey and hope that we can do this along with Operation Smile. Every three minutes, a child is born with a cleft lip or cleft palate. And the mission of Operation Smile is to provide help and support to these children through providing 6,000 medical volunteers across 80 countries who are dedicated to help these children with facial conditions, most commonly cleft lip and cleft palate. More than 200,000 children are born with a cleft every year, and they are often unable to speak, eat, socialize, or even smile. However, it can take as little as 45 minutes and cost just 180 euro or 182 francs for Operation Smile to provide a child with life-changing surgery. Now, in partnership with Operation Smile, EMEA Recruitment is raising valuable funds and aiming to create 100 new smiles to support the organization to provide free surgeries for children and young adults all over the world. Please help us by donating through the link in the bio or get in touch to see how your company can help get involved too. For the moment, I'll leave you to carry on listening to the rest of the podcast, but if there's anything I can do in terms of answering any questions or finding out how you can help and support EMEA Recruitments and Operation Smile, then please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you once again and enjoy the rest of the podcast. I mean, what, what does it feel like to be in your current role? Because the director of corporate planning, uh, you know, do, do you feel like you, you've made it now in your career? <laughs> I uh, honestly, it feels great. <laughs> I mean, I mean, there's nobody's really asked me that question before. I mean, how do I feel about that? No, I, it, feel, it feels great. Um, I've got the classical FP&A role. Um, so that's the standard stuff. So, you know, we do all the three-year planning, the budgeting, the forecasting, um, investment decision-making. We have lots of projects here. So all of that I do. But the, the good thing about this role is there's a lot of other elements as well. So I look after, well, I manage and I'm responsible for uh, all of the bonus schemes, all, all the way from the executives down to uh, down to all, all the staff members. So all the variable compensation, uh, discretionary bonus for the staff, sales incentive plans for the sales teams, so that's that's a very interesting part of the job, and I've over the past three years now, um, I've been the president president of both um, pension funds here in Geneva. So we have two pension funds: one for the international staff, one for the Swiss staff, and uh, I get really involved in the investment decision making for the portfolios, um, setting the rules for the plans. And that's really, I've really enjoyed that. I've learned a lot from it as well. You know, parts of, parts, well, pensions, I really didn't know um, at all up until I took this role on. And uh, it's been, it's been really, it's been really good. So there's, there's the scope of the role, which is excellent. Um, the, my team is outstanding. Um, I have an excellent team, um, diligent, uh, competent, um, experienced. We've got we've got some new guys in as well who who are bringing some new blood. Um, so we are very well um, respected in the organisation, and that you know it's a, it's a good feeling. Mm. It's a good mm. feeling. Mm. So oh, yeah. I'm, I'm really is it the end of where I'm at? I, I don't know. My my boss is going to be retiring soon, so who knows? <laughs> and you mentioned your your team, and and the question I was going to have. Um, well, I ask a lot of people who are looking after individuals is about the management style and how they and they get the mo- most from the team that uh, they're responsible for. And, and I suppose, obviously, you know, over COVID, a, a lot of managers have had a lot of challenge in, in this area, you know, trying to yeah. get the most from people working remotely. But now it looks like we're, we're out of that scenario now. And, but yeah. still, there are... There are challenges because you know it's very rare that people are in the office five days a week now. So I mean, how yes. how do you kind of manage your team and get the most from them? Well, I think even even before COVID, I'm I'm a firm believer in setting direction, making making sure that people know the direction we're in and what what are the priorities. And I do that. You know, I have a regular, I have my my weekly formal re- review with my assistant directors where we do that and I do that. Um, and I, I see them regularly as well and call them regularly during the week. But once that is clear for them, firm believer in letting them get on with it. Mm. You know, they're all professionals. They're all competent. They know what they're doing. Um, I'm not a micromanager. 
my people don't need to be micromanaged. So for me, that's that's setting the scene. And then something which I I had um I had a manager who was extremely good at this and he shared a lot with me. Always sharing, always honest, open, got me involved in a lot of projects, was always involving me in things. He was always um sending me emails and copying me on emails, making sure I was in, informed. And I felt really um it included because of that and he, the way he was. And I try to emulate that in my management style. So there's certain things you can't share, right? I, I understand that. But everything you can, um, you should share with your, your team. Your direct reports especially, because it makes them feel included, makes them feel part of the bigger picture. Uh, and for me, that's, that's, that's really important. It's almost, it's like, a, it's linked to honesty for me. Um, honesty and sharing are, are key key things for me. Um, I feel like the team, I, they know I'm honest with them and they know that I expect that from them. So when, and one of the things I say to them, is whenever, you know, things happen, we can make mistakes. It does happen, you know, or issues crop up. We just got to put them on the table. We've got to be honest, put everything on the table, don't hide anything, and we'll deal with it. There's always there's always a solution. We'll always find a way of dealing with it. And so it's not the fact that things go wrong. It's how you deal with them mm-hmm. that is important. And I say this a lot, uh, and I, I want them to know it and feel it and believe it because I don't want, you know, when issues do come up, they come up quickly now. They come up quickly. We see them. They're not afraid to bring anything to my desk. Um, and we deal with it. Mm-hmm. And I think that, so the honesty, the sharing, the inclusiveness, for me, that's, I, that's my management style. Well, it's the, it's the one that I think I portray. <laughs> they might have a completely different... <laughs> yeah, when you do your 360 review later, like, so it's uh, see what they say. <laughs> but, so, yeah. but I mean, it does link to what you were saying earlier, though, Mark. I mean, this approach of... Uh, sharing honesty, making people feel the inclusive. It it's it links back to what you mentioned earlier on on the trust side of things. Is all of these things help to mm. to build trust in the mm. relationship? And I think mm. if that's there, then you know they'll they'll enjoy their job. You'll enjoy your job, and and uh, and the yeah the outcome of that is that uh, the jobs get done better, mm. and the culture in the team is is better as a result. So it's all there. Yeah. Uh, you know, all going in the right direction, very positive. I mean, because do you think, I, mean, I think really that the, these are all the qualities that make leaders authentic, I suppose. I mean, is there anything, it, it, the, the, are these things that you've learned, as you say, from your, uh, from a former manager or is someone really influenced your career in this side of thinking? Yeah, it was, it was the, the manager that I had in, uh, one manager in particular that I had in Nissan who, um, had this approach and he, he did influence me. And I often think of him and what, you know, what, what, I don't, I don't say, okay, what would he do in this situation? I never got that far, but I do often think of him and think, oh, he, he would have done that. He would, he would have said that he would have d- dealt with it like that. Not all the time, you know, I'm not constantly reflecting on it, but every now and then I'll go, oh yeah, Rob, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I'd, Rob probably would have done that as well. That That's so he, he, he did influence me a lot. Cause I think he was, the one manager that really took his role as a manager seriously. It wasn't just about getting the job done or getting the numbers or getting the report or doing the project. He really put effort into being a manager and mm. managing the people side of it. So he was, he was quite an influence on me. Mm. And so I, I try and I do try and emulate that. And, and I think that is what makes you authentic. Mm. We've talked about the honesty and we've talked about the sharing. For me, that's, that's critical. But I suppose one other thing that I do try to be is, is consistent as well. You know, I, yes, you can change your mind and for good reasons when you get new information or, you know, I'm not, I'm not stubborn, but I, I feel like being consistent is important, you know, and treating people in the same way and, you know, not having favorites and not, you know, you've got to, the, the team know when people are getting preferential treatment and 
there was a before before I came, there was a little bit of that in the team, <clears throat> but I stopped that immediately. And um, yeah, it's really, I mean, the team, the team, the team's motivated, the culture's good, we're happy. Um <laughs> It's not like that everywhere. <laughs> but, but my, no. my, you know, my, you know we, we, we sort of do band together and um, and they know that I treat them equally. So it's, it, 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 for me, that that would be the third leg, I would say, of the, the way that I approach uh, um, you know, managing people. And I mean, I guess, you know, links to this, uh, I mean, we can't really have a conversation on the recruitment podcast without asking you a question about recruitment because it does link into this this question, obviously, as well. And yeah. I think, you know, obviously you've got the, you know, great team there, a great process in place with the management uh, style and, and the results happening. But I guess, ultimately, if you get the, the wrong people in the team and, and the yeah. culture, then this becomes a, a more of a challenge. So I thought I'd just ask you really what, from your experience over the years, what you feel are the, the key steps you need to have in place to get an efficient and effective recruitment process? So um, I've done this a, I've done this a few times, right? Uh, you get to sort of my age and, and you've done it quite a lot. Um, for me, it was being ex- crystal clear and what your requirements are. You must know what you want and be super clear in your mind about that and get them down on paper, number one. Number two, do not over-spec the job and do not under-spec it because you or the candidate is going to be disappointed. So you've got to get it right. So spend time thinking about that and, and getting it on paper. Be clear in the job description about what it is the person will do. So they they have a very good idea of what they're getting themselves into. Um, and I am very happy to use our HR people or our external recruitment consultants to help me in this journey. I'm not an expert in it. I've done it a few times now, but I'm, I'm not an expert. I don't know what's happening in the market. So I do listen and take advice from my HR team and my uh, external recruitment agency when when I'm when I'm looking at people they uh, you know they'll help me with the spec they'll help me with the filtering they'll so i think if you do those things um and and uh, do, make sure that during the interview you you're picking the people that f- will fit in the team then yeah you, you you'll do you'll do a good job it's it's an exciting time really because it means if you're recruiting, you're recruiting for a reason, mm-hmm. right? Somebody's either left and you need a replacement, so you've got chance for some new young blood or a mm-hmm. different perspective, or um, you've been given a new – the role has expanded, so you need, you need more people to support the role. Or the business is doing well, and you need more people because there's more work. So mm-hmm. it's an exciting time. So I, I always enjoy the recruitment process. It's not daunting for me. I, I enjoy it. It means it means good things, mm-hmm. and, and more hands to the pump. Right when you actually get the person, mm-hmm. <laughs> this is always a good thing. No, it's interesting, and I think you know, obviously. You know, I think with the, the the change in technology now, you know, with BI and data, you know, I think it's impacting on our recruitment processes, but it's impacting on things beyond that as well. I think the the finance function of the mm-hmm. of the future is is changing. I mean, our lives are changing because of BI and data. But mm-hmm. I, I was kind of wondering what what your thoughts were on the. The, the future of the finance function because this impacts on people, the culture, management style. I mean, how, how do you do you think behind data is really going to impact the way that finance will look in the future? Well, it's I have thought about this because I've 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 given an objective to to me and the team um, this year, and I'll tell you what it is in a minute. But here in IASA, we have massive amounts of data, so we we represent. Th- all the airline, well, 300 airlines in the, in the industry, which is more than 80% of the air traffic globally. So we're a non-profit organization, um, although we do make profits and, and that's, that's healthy and that's good. But we get, because of our role and what we do for the airlines, we have huge amounts of data. We have ticketing data. So all the sales, not just the sales via travel agents and so on, which we do the the banking function for, but also the direct sales, 
We have data on their operations, so all their aircraft. We have data on the so the flight operations, the ground operations, um, <laughs> weather um, around the world, and we have a specific um, product which uh, will warn other airlines if some airlines get into difficulty in different in, in, in particular parts of the world because of the weather. So we have a huge amount of data, and the the key. We, we've generated a lot of reports, not, 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 not on these operation things, but because on the financial side, because even though we're a non-profit organization, only 3% of our revenues is coming from membership fees. Okay. The other 97% is coming from commercial products and services, which we sell into the industry. So this is critical for us because that allows us the, the funding to do all the other things which we do for the industry, all the advocacy which we do with the governments in Washington and Brussels and the EU and setting um, uh, rules in place with, with, with the EU. We also do a lot of standard setting for you know, transportation of goods, lithium ion batteries, um, endangered animals, uh, pharmaceuticals. We put all those rules in place in, for the industry and it needs to be funded. And it's funded from the commercial activities we do. So all these, the combination of the standard setting um, and the commercial activities is generating a huge amount of data. We, as a function, and this is the task I've given to the team, we need to be extremely um, focused on what data is now valuable to the organisation. And over the years, we've generated a lot of BR, Power BI reports. And some of them are very useful and get used all the time. And some of them are not useful at all and don't get used. And some of them are useful, but, but are not being used. So, <laughs> so we're, we're, we're going to do an inventory of all our reports and check with the business what is it they find useful and what is it they don't find useful and what is it they think is missing. And in that way, I want to um, be be clear how we can use this massive amount of data that we have access to and make it make it useful for the organisation. And and not only that, I'm going to measure. I'm going to measure the usage. So we're we're we're, we're super clear about you know have we made an impact? Have we generated something that is useful for the organisation? So yeah, it's going to take us in a. The data, the massive amount of data we have available, the storage capacity we've got for it is great, but it does bring its own problems. And if you're not focused and clear about what you want to do with it, yeah, you're, you're, we're, we're going to be lost. Mm -hmm. So so really reaching reaching out to the business and having a, having just have, having a check with them. What is it? What is it you find useful? What is it is missing? Let's work on that. And I, th I think part of this as well, and you mentioned it there, you know, working very closely with the the business and what they want to achieve and and, and how finance can help them uh, help the business achieve these things. I mean, it shows the the progression of the finance role, really. I mean, because yeah, I mean, I mean, I know 20 years ago when I, I first started recruiting in finance, there was still plenty of roles being recruited then when it was the old fashioned type of accountant you know who weren't really yeah. speaking to people you were in the room locked away doing numbers whereas yeah. you know over the years you've seen the role uh each year become more and more where business partnering is is a big part of it and and now you know with what you're saying here it's almost gone the full extreme over this 20 year period where the reality is you know unless you have the skills or the potential skills to be a business partner then you're not you're going to struggle to to succeed in their career in finance because yeah. you know then artificial intelligence can probably do the numbers job. Uh, it's the business partnering that is going to be important in the, the role moving forward. Absolutely, absolutely, and 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 it's yeah, especially in, you know we do have a finance function and we we do have the accountants and they we let them out of the room every now and again. <laughs> 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 but my my guys are you know constantly in in constantly in the business. Mm -hmm. in the meetings they go to the management meetings and in fact they they request a representative from my function to go to the management teams because they 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 appreciate and value the the advice and the information we have and the advice we give and 
So it's uh, yeah, you've got you've got to have those you've got to have those uh, people skills as well. Mm-hmm. That's one of the things I look for when I'm you know when I'm recruiting. It's great that you can you know if everybody's got an, an accounting qualification, that's great. But uh, you, you need the people skills as well if you're going to be if you're going to success in the the FP&A part of the world. Yeah, because I mean, I suppose as well, you know, you mentioned the management style and the thing is you're trying to get the, the you know, you're doing and you're trying to get the scene to do is have that, that that clear direction to know what their priorities are and keep the, the focus there. Because I suppose if you're not careful with the amount of data that's, that's out there and the amount of analysis needed, so you could end up just working, you know, really extreme hours on, on, on some things that the business doesn't even kind of want or need, you know, so you have to be quite careful in, in where you're spending your time. But otherwise, you're just, uh, yeah, probably going to suffer burnout from working on things that aren't really needed. Yeah, you, there's definitely a risk of that, um, f- for sure. Um, although we are, you know, during, during COVID, the industry, the aviation industry got absolutely battered. Mm-hmm. And uh, as a result of that, I asked her, we, we also, you know, we lost huge amounts of our revenue and we had to go through a restructuring. We lost 20% of our positions, one in five. So I lost four people from my team and we haven't replaced them. The business is almost back, almost back to where it was pre-COVID, especially with China opening up now. The, the, uh, you know, the, the volume is really ramping up um, and we haven't replaced those people. So we have to be absolutely laser sharp on on prioritization because we, we can't do everything we can't do everything that we did before um and we don't have the time for it mm-hmm. so we are we are extremely critical in what we what we accept and what we you know we got a lot of requests in for reports analysis that you know we we, we can't say yes to everything and we don't no, no, I mean, I think, you know, it's something that's, um, I think over COVID has been highlighted a lot more, you know, people trying to you know, make sure that they, they they keep their health and fitness prioritised uh, as well, you know, so as well mm. as, you know, trying to give 100% at work, also making sure that they're uh, looking after themselves. And I think you mm. mentioned yourself, you know, obviously the the airline industry or any any industry connected with the airline industry was one of the toughest uh, or the hardest hit over COVID for obvious obvious reasons. And it was obviously a pretty stressful time for everybody involved. And I, I was going to kind of ask you how you kind of, yeah, managed to get through that yourself kind of mentally, I suppose. You know, it was the only way you tend to kind of unwind after work. I mean, uh, you know, do you, are you a big fan of meditation or uh, yoga or anything like that? So, or is it more, uh, uh, yeah, going to the pub and uh, as I discovered <laughs> that when we're offline listening to 80s music, I don't know what is there anything you tend to do to, to recover from the stressful days at work? <laughs> For me, it's, um, I, I'm, I like sports. So I've always, you know, I've always played sports and uh, I've, I used to play rugby, but I got into my thirties and I couldn't play that. I couldn't play that anymore. It's too, <laughs> it's too hard on the body. So I moved into football. I never kicked a ball in my life, um, and I picked that up when I was sort of like mid thirties, <laughs> and I've stuck with it. So I, there's me and a bunch of lads who are about my age, and uh, we we just kick a ball around on a Monday. So I do that tennis. Just played tennis this weekend. I, I've rediscovered tennis. I, I dropped it for a long time. Um, and last year I picked it up again, so I was really happy with that. But my yeah, my, my back is, uh, is is shot at. So what I've been doing for the past year, I've been doing five minutes of yoga every day. Oh, okay, and okay. Uh, it's just a little app you can get. Mm. It's a five minute yoga app. Oh, what a difference it's made! Mm. It, it, yeah, it's really it's really made a big difference. I was all I was all getting all tense in my back and. My uh, Achilles tendons were, were, were um, suffering, and uh, no, no, it's it's made. I, mean, I I used to poke fun at people doing yoga. My mum's, my mum's been doing it for years. She, she's 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 strong as an ox, and, uh, super flexible and supple. And and I'm thinking, and I, so I'm thinking, there's got to be something in this. Yeah. So instead of me poking fun at it, <laughs> let me let me do it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I've literally five minutes every day. That's all. That's all. There's a little bit of stretching, some some poses, a um, little bit of the breathing, and then yeah, I, I'm quite honestly, I'm 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 a bit of a convert now. <laughs> that is true. I mean, it's it's one of those things. I mean, we we have a 
like a yoga instructor comes into the EMEA office once yeah. a week and uh, yeah. you know and, and initially it was very um the, the class was very kind of female led but the yeah. gradually i think as all, all the all the women have been saying how yeah the benefits that they've been yeah. getting from it gradually yeah. the 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 guys have been starting to turn up and now it's about a 50 50 split because all oh, the good. all the lads are now saying actually this is this is pretty yeah. good. There's something. Uh, there's something in this, as you say. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it can't be all bad. <laughs> I should have listened to my mum uh, 15 years ago. You know, when she, was, <laughs> <laughs> when, she was, when she was telling me you should, you should, you should check this out. You should do this. No, um, <laughs> oh, no. That's, um, really, yoga? No, football? Yes, yoga? No, no, it's completely changed. So, <laughs> yeah, um, it's good. It's really good. Yeah, and that that almost seamlessly brings me on to the last question, really. So it's quite a uh, yeah. So light hard one to end with. We started on light hard questions, so I thought we'd end on one as well. So I was going to say, if you could go back in time and talk to your uh, an eighteen year old version of yourself, but what what would be the uh, the biggest piece of advice you would give to the eighteen year old Mark Steele? Do more yoga, yoga maybe. Let's say no. Uh, yeah, I should. That would be, that would be point number three. <laughs> But I, I did. I've, I'm not. I haven't thought about this. I hadn't until you, you know, you asked me this, and um, so it did. It, I did reflect on it quite deeply, and I realised that when I was in my early part of my career, on midway, mid, mid part of my, so let's say into my into my forties, really, um, the career was the most important thing for me, and I put it. I put it before my family in quite a few instances. I'm not, I'm not just talking about the moves, but, you know, when the kids are younger, I mm. felt like I did miss some. I, I wasn't a completely absent father. I wasn't travelling all the time, but there were certain things where I, my wife would say, oh, can we do this or can we go there? And I'm, no, I'm, you know, you know, I'm busy. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I haven't got time for that. Mm. Um, and I thought I... The, the, I'm, I'm at an age now where I realise family's more important, health is more important, friends are more important. Um, and I would tell my 18-year-old self that, you know, every now and again, you know, career is important, you've got to do it, but every now and again you've got to, you, you've got to put your family first and do some, you know, do some of the things that they, they, ought, they want to do mm. um, because the kids grow up so quickly. Mm. And uh, my kids have started to flee, start, you know, starting to flee the nest, the nest now. So that's what I would, on a deeper level, I would tell mm. myself. Mm. Um, and then the second thing I would tell myself on a more lighthearted note, I would tell my younger self to get into the oil industry. <laughs> now I know that is not politically correct, <laughs> but. Everybody I know in the oil industry has either retired early or is, has made massive amounts of money. <laughs> and I'm thinking, these guys are no, they're not brighter than me. <laughs> so so what, what, have I, what have I done that I, I've chosen a different industry and a different career path? But yeah, yeah. I mean, oil industry, these guys are, these guys are making good money. <laughs> There you go. What you need to find is the, the the new version of the oil industry. I think there's maybe something well, in line with behind data. It's got to be one of these one of these guys coming through. Maybe. Well, I think it, I think it will still be the energy business. Mm. I think it's just mm. you know it'll, it won't be oil anymore. It'll, you know it, it'll be moving into the renewables. Mm. Mm. I think I think that that that, that would definitely be a, a place to go. Mm. That mm. that cybersecurity and AI. You know that's that's the future. No, that's it. I think uh, you know it's it's one, and, and I think in terms of the the first thing you, you mentioned there as well about family. I mean, it's good that you've kind of you've see, you've seen this uh, still at a young age. You know, I mean, like it would have been you probably would have been quite disappointed in yourself if you got to the age of seventy or eighty and had, had this uh, thought. But actually, yes. it's still uh, you're still young enough to do something about it. And uh, you know, and it's um, yeah. I mean, I think that's that's the important uh, thing as well. You know, trying to you know picking this up while you can still act on it really as well. Well, it. it, it it really, it really, it hit me a couple of years ago and it really did change the way that, you know, we had, because my youngest boy is getting older, so I was going, oh, God, I'm going to have two more years with him and then he's off. Well, he, mm -hmm. he's at that age where he's off now. He's, he doesn't, you know, he's not with us anymore. And, um, but the, for the past 
two years, I was, you know, I made a real effort. I know it was COVID and everything, but I made a real effort. We did a lot of holidays together. We did a lot of stuff together. Um, and and, and I, the past two years, I really intensified it. But I would say for about three or four years, even before that, I'd started to to change my my priorities. Mm. I think I think coming to IR to help that, you know. Mm, mm. I think I think Nissan was was extremely it's extremely competitive and extremely commercially minded. Mm. And I also, even though a big part of what we do is commercial, it, it's it's the, the, the balance is better. Mm, mm-hmm. So the, that's really that has helped me as well. No, no, I think reason, you know a lot of companies are kind of realizing that as well. You know, I think you know the the the, the they're trying now to live up to the. The, the vision the values that, that they 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 the in the past maybe been on mm. on the internet or in the the corporate brochure but uh, haven't really been kind of looked at since mm. they're in there you know I think a lot mm. of companies mm. now realize actually mm. yeah it's a, it's a big part of, of attracting and retaining the right people you know mm. I, I think um yeah. you know there are always circumstances mm. where you know you've got to work long hours and, and, and long weeks but so I think if you're not many people uh are maybe willing to do it on a, a regular basis, fifty-two mm. weeks of the year. You know, I think yeah. that I think that's the the thing over COVID that has or we've seen has changed massively yeah. in uh, people's yeah. decisions on what companies they they want to work for. So I think that's a big big positive, really. But mm. uh, but great to speak to you today, Mark. I really appreciate your time. I know I've got a lot from the conversation. I know the network will get a lot from it as well. So it's uh, yeah, great to have this this time with you. I mean, if any of the Kind of network wants to reach out and and uh, and uh, and connect with you. I guess is LinkedIn is the best way yeah, to get Yeah, LinkedIn. You. I'm, I'm yeah. you'll find me on LinkedIn. So that's yeah. absolutely the right way. Perfect. It's a pleasure well, as well, Paul. Thanks, thanks for thanks for inviting me, and uh, it's made me reflect on a couple of things that I, you know, I probably would not have done myself. So thank mm. you as well. No, no problem at all. As I say, not not the uh, normal uh, Monday for you today, I guess. So it starts <laughs> off with a, uh, a joke about the Flintstones yeah. and then a discussion about uh, reflecting on the 18-year-old version of yourself. So yeah. not, not the typical Monday for you, I think. No, not at all. It's exciting. Let's see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Cheers, Mark. I will speak to you later on, and uh, we'll, we'll put the link to your profile on the uh, on the podcast when it goes when it goes live. Smashing. All the best, yeah. Paul. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye, bye, bye. Thank you for listening to today's podcast episode. If you'd like to reach out to Paul or myself, please feel free to send a connection through on LinkedIn. And if you'd like to listen to previous episodes of the podcast, you can find them all at our website, www.emearecruitment.eu.